Yeah, let's continue. Uh, so we stopped with the attribute of God being a spirit being. And then the next point that we will look at is that God is self-existent. He doesn't depend on anyone for his existence. He's not depending on anyone to give him life and being able to continue living. No, he's completely uh, you know, self-existent, does not depend on anyone for anything, which is why. He was 14. He describes himself in a particular way. So if someone could read out Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. Hmm. So God says, I am what I am. Or, you know, if you want to put it in another way, I, I will be whatever I choose to be. So God is not depending on anyone to be something. For instance, you know, if you and I want to be uh, successful, if we want to be skilled, we depend on God to make us successful, to make us skilled. God is not depending on anyone for anything. Whatever he chooses to be, he is. Okay, so he says, I am what I am. I will be what I will be. So I am. No one needs to help me to be. So uh, his self-existence is total lack of dependence on anyone or anything you know it's what he describes in his name when he calls himself the i am um, another aspect of god is that he is unified he's like a unified whole um, in the sense all the attributes of god work together in harmony his holiness is in harmony with his goodness. His truthfulness is in harmony with his faithfulness. All the attributes of God are in harmony with each other. They all bring out his character in the same way. They all express all his attributes express his character in the same way. But some people say, oh, how can you say that about the love of God and the anger of God? Now, aren't they two opposing factors? Because the love of God makes him treat people in a particular way. But the anger of God makes him treat people in a different way. So are those two attributes, are they not in clash with each other? Is what people ask. But then we see that even God's love and his anger, those also are bringing out the same nature of God. Both of the both love and anger express his character in the same way. Uh, now you know there's this um, it's this saying which somebody came up with, you know, to try and explain this. And so they say God hates sin, but He loves the sinner. But then when you look at the scriptures, you see a lot of places where God is quite angry with the sinner. No, he doesn't just say, oh, yeah, the sin is very bad. Oh, but I know I love this person, so I'll just be nice to them. No, we do see many, many Bible passages where God hates the sin and he's pretty angry with the sinner. So we can't just say, oh, God loves the sinner and leave it at that. Uh, God is angry. One really strong expression of anger. Um, maybe uh, we could look at Deuteronomy chapter 9. Now, uh, verse 13 and 14, just for us to get a background of that, you know, Moses has been on the mountain with God for 40 days and nights, and God is giving him this beautiful covenant, you know, where he says, I am going to be your God, and I'm going to make you people my people. So uh, with a lot of love, he's, you know, um, putting down all of these covenant uh, things which they need to follow. So he's making all this happen on the mountain with Moses. And what are the people doing down below? They are not grateful that God wants to be their God. They are like, too busy trying to make idols and you know uh, uh, do other things. And so at that time, God is so angry. And this is what God says in Deuteronomy chapter 9. Let's look at verses 13 and 14. Uh, 
Okay, so here, God hates the sin. He hates what they were up to, you know, uh, down in the valley. And he is also very, very angry with the sinners who have been busily indulging in sin. And this is what he says about them. He says, you know, um, don't get in my way, he says to Moses, you know, so don't try to, you know, intervene or anything. I want to destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven. So it does. it's not always, you know, quite correct to say God hates sin, but he loves the sinner. Uh, there is some truth in that, in the sense, God is willing to have his mind changed about his anger. So in that sense, yes. He loves the sinner. But if the sinner continues to sin and has no desire to repent, no desire to change, then all that person can expect from God is judgment. On the other hand, God is willing to give that person a chance to change his mind about the anger, which is what happens in this particular example. When God says, you know, I want to blot out their name, I want to destroy them. And you know, Moses, what? I'm going to take your son and I'm going to make a new nation out of them. And at that time, um, Moses, who has the heart of God, who has the same kind of love that God has, he, you know, uh, he actually falls down before God and he uh, spends 40 days and nights fasting and praying. Uh, so, you know, we, we know about the 40 days and nights which he spent on the mountain where he was in God's presence. But generally, we are not very aware of another 40 days and nights when Moses was very, very busy interceding for these stubborn people. And that we see in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 17 to 21. Um, you know, he says in verse 18, he says, Then once again I fell prostrate before the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. I um huh. Deuteronomy 9:18. Yeah. And he says, I ate no bread and drank no water because of all the sin you had committed. And he says, uh, in verse 19, I feared the anger and wrath of the Lord, for he was angry enough with you to destroy you. Okay, so we can't just simply say, Oh, God loves the sinner. God is angry enough to destroy them in this play over here. But again, the Lord listened to me, he says. And in verse 20, he says, And the Lord was angry enough with Aaron to destroy him. But at that time, I prayed for Aaron too. So we see that God is very, very angry with the sinner. But God is willing to have his mind changed. Okay, so if the person repents, if, this, if they are willing to change their ways, is more than willing to change his mind and just, you know, uh, put aside his judgment, put aside the punishment. And that is why he says in Ezekiel 33, 11, a lovely verse. Someone could read out Ezekiel 33, verse 11. Okay, so here God says, it gives me no pleasure, no happiness to, you know, punish people and judge them and destroy them. It says, I'd rather that they turn from their ways and live. So he cries out and says, turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? So there is an anger of God, which is a strong attribute that he has. He hates sin. And he hates evildoers. He hates the wicked. But there's another attribute of God, which is the love of God. And because he has a love, uh, you know, loving nature as well, he is willing to turn away from his anger if the people would just give him an opportunity. So he says, turn away from your wickedness, because then I will be able to show you the other attribute, you know, which I hold. So you see over here, God's character has not changed at all. He still hates sin. He still hates wickedness. Uh, and he is uh, still capable of anger and wrath. It's just that 
he is willing to change and turn away from his anger if the people will give him a chance for that by repenting uh, so uh, maybe we could look at the next attribute which is the unchanging nature of god so god's nature god's character that does not change it stays constant it stays the same it's the way the people respond it's the way the way the way people behave that determines what god does god on his side has not changed he stays the same um you know especially when people are talking about the old testament god and the new testament god they say oh the old testament god was such an angry god and they say the new testament god is such a gentle god of love uh, but you know uh, it's the covenants which changed the old testament covenant what is the covenant mosaic covenant god says if you will be faithful to me if you will keep the covenant and do what i am asking you to do then i will bring blessings upon you then i will heal your land then i will you know uh, bring prosperity into your homes if you do your part i will do my part that was the covenant so based on that covenant you know whenever they sinned whenever they messed up oh he would wait patiently but in the end if they continue to do what they were doing whatever god had promised would happen you no know, they would see punishment coming upon their heads but here in the new testament we are under a different covenant in this covenant uh, christ jesus has already finished taking the judgment and the punishment so it doesn't get released upon us uh, it will only get released you know in the end time on judgment day for people who have you know chosen not to come under the protection of jesus christ so obviously it will fall upon them but now while we are living under this new covenant uh, jesus christ has already taken that punishment upon him so that is why we see god being gentle now simply because jesus christ has taken that upon him he did the atonement he took the punishment so that we can have uh you know the gentle side of god so the covenant changed but god never changed his character never changed he always stayed constant so maybe uh, as we are touching upon this we could also maybe quickly look at the wrath of god the anger of god um let's look at romans chapter 1 verse 18 uh, you know which we already read um but you know if just if you could read it again romans 1:18 Hmm. Okay, so uh, one aspect of God's nature is His wrath, His anger, and it is being expressed against godlessness. It is being expressed against the wickedness of people. Uh, so that's a reality that we have to accept. But on the other side you also have malachi chapter 3 verses 6 to 7 if someone could read out that malachi 3 6 to 7 So, yes so god says i have not changed in any way my character has not changed in any way if you return to me i will return to you okay so um it depends on the response of the people how god will uh, you know uh, handle the situation coming to the another aspect uh, of god god's truthfulness again you know where in a lot of places where god says i am not a god who lies he is again talking in terms of this whole uh, concept of sin and judgment and all of that um so uh, maybe we can look at a couple of verses where he says you know i i i do not lie i'm not a human being to lie and then he actually uses uses those words in terms of sin and judgment okay so uh, numbers 23 verse 11 Yeah, if someone could read out Numbers twenty-three verse eleven. Mm. Okay, so just for us to get a little bit of background, Balak is the king over here, and he wants uh, 
uh, Balaam to curse the Israelites so that they will be defeated in war and then he'll be able to take over there, you know, take them over. So that was the idea. And so he hires Balaam for that task. And Balaam again and again goes on blessing the people instead of cursing them. So Balak finally says, he says, I brought you to curse my enemies, but you have done nothing but bless them. And this is the reply explanation which Balaam gives in Numbers 23 verses 19 to 20. Numbers 23, 19 to 20, Balaam explains why he is going on blessing the Israelites. Hmm. Okay, so Balaam explains and says, God decides. So God has decided that he is going to bless the people. So I cannot speak a curse upon these people because God has made up his mind and God is not a human being who changes you know, his, his mind just like that. So once he has decided to bless the people, what can I do? I cannot speak a curse upon them because he has decided that he wants to bless them. And uh, so in fact, uh, you know, later on we get to know, he comes up with another tactic to help Balak, uh, which we find in Revelation chapter 2. 2 verse 14 you know, so just for clarification if we can just cover that verse as well Revelation chapter 2 verse 14 Yeah, so uh, Balaam, you know, explains and says, I cannot curse the people because God has decided that he wants to bless them. Once God speaks something, he will do it. He does not lie. He does not change his mind. So there's one way that you can make God's curses come upon the people. What you need to do is you need to get them, you know, into eating um, uh, food offered to idols and you must get them involved in sexual immorality because then God will, uh, you know, bring curses upon them. So he teaches Balak how the Israelites can get cursed. So God's nature and character never changed throughout that whole story. God still hates sin. He still hates wickedness. He, he still believes in judging the e evil, but he is willing to change his mind if people will come in line with his character and obey him and follow what he is asking them to do. Okay, so uh, God's character remains constant throughout the thing. It's the people who choose to obey in the beginning and then later they go into sin because, you know, they, uh, they give in to Balaam's strategy. So... Um, again, we have another verse which brings out the same concept. Uh, I'm not particularly sure, but it's very interesting to see that wherever God says, you know, I do not lie, I'm not like a human, he's talking in terms of sin and judgment and his response to sin. Uh, so uh, this other example that we could look at is 1 Samuel 15, 27 to 29. 1 Samuel 15, 27 to 29, if someone could read out. Okay, so um, here Saul has disobeyed the Lord and uh, Samuel says something, uh, you know, um, interesting. He says, he who is the God of Israel does not lie or change his mind. God had promised that he would give you the kingdom. Okay, he's saying to Saul, God had promised that he would give you the kingdom. But now you have chosen to disobey God. So you have lost the kingdom because of your foolishness. If you had remained faithful to the Lord, the Lord would have, you know, um, continued to let you have the kingdom, is what, you know, Samuel is trying to explain over here. Um, 
yeah and then uh, you when you go to first samuel 15 verses 34 to 35 uh, there uh, it it says and the lord regretted that he had made saul king over israel so god was sorry that saul's behavior his conduct changed in the beginning he was loyal later he chose to be disloyal on the other hand if he had stayed faithful you know he, he, the kingdom would have been his forever that is what is stated in first samuel 13 13 if someone could read out first samuel 13 13 that's true. Hmm. Yeah, you know, he says, the Lord says over here, uh, no, Samuel explains over here, if you had obeyed the Lord, you know, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time, forever and ever. So, I mean, I mean, I don't know how God would have worked out the details, but rather than the Messiah being called, you know, King, you know, son of David, maybe he would have been called son of Saul. I mean, I don't know how God would have arranged the his historical details if that had happened. But God was actually completely okay with making Saul's kingdom last forever and ever. But it was the behavior of Saul which changed the situation. God remained faithful. God remained constant. He did not change. He stayed truthful. It was Saul who changed the whole equation by his behavior. Okay, so um, so God is truthful and God is also faithful. You know, one simple verse that we can look uh, at regarding the faithfulness of God, uh, it, it would be Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 8 to 9. Maybe you could just read out verse 9, Deuteronomy 7, 9. Yeah, so he is a faithful God who keeps how I mean how great is his faithfulness? He keeps his covenant of love to a thousand generations. Uh you know, I mean, I just I mean, this is just a thought, okay? I'm not, I'm not sure how doctrinally correct it is and all of that, but um, it's just that, you know, my direct great, 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 oh, great grandparents or great, great, I can't uh, figure out the genealogy. But the thing is, you see, those people, uh, they made a real commitment to the Lord when um, they had to give up, uh, you know, their faith and become believers so at that point of time they lost everything they were like just literally thrown out of their house uh, and um, you know the property that they had the wealth that they had everything they lost they literally with, with just the clothes you know on their back and you know with with a trunk or something they used to have trunks in those days nowadays nobody even knows what a trunk is so anyway that, with, with that you know they just set out from their house so I think that faithfulness which they showed towards the Lord, God rewarded that, you know, generation after generation. If um, that's what my dad always, you know, he says, um, you know, we are here today in this position of blessing that we are in because of the loyalty which, you know, the, uh, that those great grandparents showed towards the Lord. So when God sees someone being faithful towards him, he stays faithful, not just to you but to your descendants and their descendants. Uh, so he's, he's an amazingly faithful God. You know, uh, uh, so when I look at how my family was able to, you know, uh, uh, manage and flourish, and I look at the other, you know, relatives, uh, how who did not do that well, I think God's hand, I think, may be upon us because of what those people did and what they went through and how they stood for God. So because of that, we enjoyed the benefits of it. We enjoyed the fruit of it. So his faithfulness extends over generations. He's that faithful. Okay, that's the, that's the faithfulness of God that we see. Um, 
we also have the other attribute of God, which is that he is a triune God. We'll just look at one verse. We'll not get into details uh, simply because we'll be covering the doctrine of Trinity, you know, in one of our classes. Uh, I think probably next class, yeah. So today we'll just look at one verse, John 14, 26, if someone could read out. In this verse, you have the Trinity being mentioned because uh, the helper who will be sent to us, that's the Holy Spirit. Who will do the sending? The Father will send the Holy Spirit. And in whose name is the Holy Spirit being sent? In the name of Jesus. So here you have all three persons of the Trinity being mentioned. And so this verse kind of brings out the fact that God is a triune God. Uh, so we don't have any verse in the Bible which says, behold, God is triune. We don't have such a verse. But there are verses which bring out all the three persons of the Trinity, which is how we know that God is a triune being. Now we'll get into more details regarding that when we cover the next class. So we'll just move on to the next attribute of God, which is his sovereignty. Um, God is free to do whatever he chooses to do because he is sovereign. No one can control him. No one can dictate to him and say, you should do this. No, he is sovereign. He is free to do whatever he wishes to do, uh, which is explained you know, in Isaiah 46.10. What does it say over there? Isaiah 46.10. My purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. Okay, so um, God has certain purposes and plans for creation and those will be fulfilled. His purpose will stand. He will do all that he pleases. But even though he is sovereign, he has chosen to allow human beings to have free will. So he allows uh, humans to choose what they want to do, even though he is sovereign. So what happens in the end? Does the sovereignty of God clash with the free will of humans? And are God's purposes defeated as a result of that? Not necessarily. Because you see, God's purpose, when he made a pur the purpose in his heart, he had already decided that he would send uh, Jesus Christ on behalf of sinful humans. So those who choose to bring their free will in line with his will, they will enjoy the benefits of what he has planned. So that is covered in his purpose. And he also knows those people who will refuse to you know, line up with God's will. Such people, they will experience his judgment. Beforehand itself, when God made his purposes, he already knew who will respond how. So he already is aware of all the details. So he knows what free choices humans will make, good choices that those who are godly will make, the bad choices which the wicked will make. Having known all of that in his omniscience, he has purposed certain things. So the free will and the free, free actions of humans will not cancel out God's sovereignty. What God has purposed, in the end, ultimately, it will be fulfilled. All that he pleases will take place. But at the human level, he gave humans the dignity to choose what choices they would make. He never controlled them like robots and forced them to be a particular way. They have the freedom to choose because they were created in his image, right? So humans have, because they've been created in his image, he gives them the dignity of making their own free choices. But ultimately, it will not affect his sovereignty because even when he was making his purposes, he already knew what the responses of different people would be. So he's allowing different responses to take place because in the end, he's going to bring it all together and accomplish what pleases him. Okay, so uh, 
his sovereignty is not affected by our free will. Um, so the you know scholars kind of try to talk about this uh, using two terms. They talk about God's antecedent will and his subsequent will. So God's antecedent will is that everyone should be saved. That is his antecedent will. He wants everyone to go to heaven. He wants everyone to repent. He wants everyone to accept him. That is his antecedent will, uh, which we see expressed in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. If we can have someone read out 2 Peter 3, 9. Yeah, so God, that is his antecedent will. What is his antecedent will? Uh, that no one should perish and that everyone should come to repentance. That is his antecedent will. But then John 3, 16, the very, very popular verse that we all love and know, if we can read a few extra verses over there, then we see what his subsequent will is. John 3, 16 to 18, if, if we could read out. Hmm. Okay, so you have John 3, 16 and 17. Those two verses express his antecedent will. He does not want anyone to perish. He wants everyone to have eternal life. He did not come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. That is his antecedent will. But verse 18, it says, whoever believes in him is not condemned. But... Whoever does not believe stands condemned already. So it's up to the people to choose. If they decide to exercise their free will and say, no, I do not want to submit to the Lord and accept what he is offering, then obviously, you know, you would stand condemned. So uh, they talk about it as being the antecedent and the subsequent will of God. Okay, so coming to a few other communicable attributes of God, we have already covered some uh, communicable attributes. We talked about God being truthful, faithful. These are all qualities which we also share along with him. Uh, so um, some other communicable attributes that God has. Um, God is a person uh, in the sense he is someone uh, who is intelligent. He has feelings. So he is able to have relationships with others. Uh, so God is a person and he likes to have a relationship with people. Um, God is holy. Now that's one of his more, uh, most, you know, um, most evident characteristics. So God is holy and the Hebrew word for that is kadosh. The word kadosh basically means something that is set apart. It's separate and unique and special and distinct. Okay, so God is holy in the sense he's completely other, he's completely set apart. And he wants us also to be like that, uh, where we are not like the world, but we are set apart. We are distinct. We are special. We are unique. That's the way. Just so he wants us to reflect his nature. He wants to share his holiness with us so um you know it's in fact a privilege that he is giving us uh, so when you know god says um in leviticus 11:44 a very very popular verse if someone could read out 11 uh, leviticus 11:44 Yeah, we, 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 we can just take that first part of the verse. So he says, 
be holy because I am holy. It's not just a rule that he is giving. It's not just something that is imposing upon us, some painful duty which we have to now endure. Oh, just because he's holy, now I have to be holy. No, it's not meant to be a burden. It's a privilege that he's, he's giving. He's saying, I am beautiful in my holiness and I want to share my beauty with you. So my holiness, I'm taking it and I'm giving it to you and you know, allowing you to enjoy that and be a, you know, be a part of it. So God is not imposing his holiness upon us like some duty. It is a privilege that he's calling us into. He never asked the cockroaches to be holy like he is. You know, I mean, no, that isn't, uh, it's not something that is sharing. It's not sharing his nature with them. But humans are special to him. We are created in his own image. And so he wants to share his, the most beautiful thing about him, which is his holiness, he wants to share that with us. So it's in fact a privilege that he's giving us when he says, you know, be holy even as I am holy. Um, another attribute of God that uh, we could consider is his righteousness. And what is Psalm 71 verses 19 to 20? What does it say about the righteousness of God? Someone could read out Psalm 71, 19 to 20. Okay, so um, there's a lot of controversy about who wrote which particular psalm, whether David actually wrote some of the psalms, or whether they just put his name as a heading, all of that. But you know, we could really believe that maybe this uh, this particular psalm uh, was written by David. Um, you know, it says, "Though you have made me see troubles many and bitter." You know, he went through a lot of troubles, a lot of bitter struggles. His life was not at all easy. He says, in spite of all of that, you will restore my life again. You know, he says, from the depths of the earth, you will again bring me up. Why? Because your righteousness, God, reaches to the heavens. So you are somebody who will treat me right. So in spite of having a bitter life of struggles, in spite of all that, you know, the troubles that he had to face, he knows that in the end, his life will be restored. God will lift him up. Why? Because God is a righteous God. He does what is right. He treats us in the right way. He does not let us down. Okay, so that is one confidence uh, that we too can have just like the psalmist. Um, Another quality of God that we can look at is his justice. Uh, so um, maybe if we can look at Psalm 94, verses 1 to 3. Psalm 94, 1 to 3. So in Psalm 94, you know, the psalmist is calling upon God and saying, Lord, you know, avenge me. Wrong things have been done to me. Evil things, injustice has been done to me. Now, Lord, you avenge me. And he says in verse 2, pay back to the proud what they deserve. They are so proud, they think, you know, they can destroy me and escape. But Lord, you avenge me. Uh, and so he's calling upon the... Uh, he, he, he calls God the judge of the earth because you are the judge of the earth, because you're a God who brings justice. You, O oh Lord, avenge me. Look at what these proud people have done to me and you, you know, you fight for my cause. And we see the same thing being brought out so beautifully even in the New Testament, you know, where Jesus talks about God being a God of justice. Uh, Luke 18, 6 to 8, if someone could read out. Luke 18, 6 to 8. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, and shall draw the law of the heavens to the heaven, that I may be my son, the birth of the dead. I tell you that you will attend to me, and this will come back to us. 
Yeah, um, you know, just to clarify, um, the Leviticus reference was Leviticus eleven forty four, where it says, you know, consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. Okay, that was Leviticus eleven forty four. So yeah, coming back to our, what we are talking about, the God of justice. And so here in uh, uh, Luke chapter 18, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, is encouraging them to continue believing in the justice of God. You know, just because prayer is uh, prayer's answer is not coming, he says, don't give up, continue to pray. Why? Because, you know, uh, he says in the example which he gives about that unjust judge, who doesn't even want to give justice to the widow, but because the widow goes on persisting, he says, oh my goodness, this lady is troubling me. Because she is troubling me, let me give her justice. And Jesus says, when a man like that, who doesn't even have any love and compassion in his heart, if such a man gives justice, don't you think God, who is the God of justice, don't you think that he will give justice to his people who are crying out to him day and night? And he says in verse 8, uh, Luke 18, 8, the Lord says, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly, you know, and uh, uh, when uh, something had happened, you know, many, many years ago, uh, I kind of was claiming this uh, scripture passage because, uh, you know, just coincidentally, uh, that particular event, incident, it involved a widow. That person, she was a wonderful believer and she was a widow. And this person was trying to cheat her out of some property. He was using, you know, his, um, his, his crooked means uh, to kind of squeeze her out of some property which belonged to her and so i said lord you have given us luke chapter 18 so i know you will do justice and i really began to claim that scripture and pray you know that that uh, justice would happen but then after many months that property went to that crooked man and i was like so disappointed i said oh lord i really thought you're going to do something uh, some great miracle is going to happen and it didn't why, Lord, you are a God of justice. You said over here, you know, he, he, he will see that they get justice and quickly. Lord, why, why? And then later on, you know, as the years went by, I looked at the way God blessed that lady and things that he did in their family. So sometimes God allows things to take place, but ultimately he is a righteous God. He is a faithful God. He is a God of justice. So in his own way, he made up, you know, that loss for her. So which is something that I've come to realize, uh, you know, when, when something really bad happens and I get really angry and I get worked up and I'm, you know, um, shouting and grumbling and all of that. And my dad says, just wait. God is a God of justice. It's true that injustice has been done to us, but he'll make up for it in some other way. You see, in some other way, he will bless us and repay us for it. And over the years, I've noticed that it actually is true because he is righteous. He is faithful. Sometimes he may allow you know, some in a wicked thing to be done to us, but he will repay us and make up for it in some way because of his great faithfulness towards us. So we can trust him. We can look to him because um, he is. And so he says in the very last portion over there, Luke 18 verse 8, he says, however, when the son of man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Because there'll be a whole lot of people like me, you know, who say, oh, it didn't happen. Tja, maybe God doesn't really you know, keep his promises. But Jesus says, you know, why don't you be among the minority which continues to hold on in spite of what happened and then see what happens. So there will be some people, a small minority, who will continue to hold on in faith in spite of everything that happened. And oh, great will be their reward because they understood the character of God and they held on to it. They refused to be swayed. They refused to stop believing. They continue to believe and, you know, uh, great will be the reward of such people. So we need to hold on to this particular attribute of God, that he is a God of justice because we are living in an evil world where evil things, God allows it sometimes. But we need to know that because we are his people and we are continuing to trust in him, he will come through for us in his time 
in his way um yeah another aspect of god's um, uh, you know uh, nature would be his love and um, it's really nice uh, you know um, uh, people generally quote john 3:16 when they talk about the love of god uh, but then there's another lovely scripture maybe we can look at first john chapter 4 verses 8 to 10 First John four eight to ten. If someone could read out. That he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the propitiation for our sins. You know, maybe you could get an easier Bible version for yourself, where the English would be simpler. Also, you would be able to you would be able to understand the words which you are reading because that would be you know simpler English. Uh, that is uh, English. For that, you need to be I don't know a scholar in English to be able to understand those big big words. it's a little complicated that by that that particular version so here there's a definition being given about love this is love okay this is the definition of love what is the definition of love not that we loved god but that he loved us and sent his son so you see love is being expressed even though you know without even expecting anything in return even when the people are not even in a position to give back to him you know and show back their loyalty and gratitude love is something which is just given generously without expecting anything in return so even if the people you know there there are there are going to be people who are going to reject his love they're going to reject the sacrifice that he has offered but in spite of that he just freely gives his son even to those people now it's up to them if they really don't want to you know have him and they reject him that is up to them but he is giving something freely even if there is nothing being given in return that is love where uh, you're selflessly giving yourself and your commitment and your faithfulness and your truthfulness and all of you to a bunch of people and leaving it to them whether they want to you know accept what you're giving or not but from your side you are loving them to that extent even when it is not reciprocated you choose to love and that is why it says in the scriptures you know god gives his rain not just to the good people he gives the rain even to the wicked why because uh, in his heart he only has you know faithfulness towards people now how they choose to respond of course is up to them okay so um so uh, we see that the love of god is so uh, lavish it is selfless is not expecting something back in return even if it is not reciprocated he chooses to continue to love and the really nice thing about god's love is that even when he is correcting us even when he is disciplining us he still loves us he disciplines us out of love not out of anger and uh, we see that in hebrews chapter 12 verses 5 to 6 if someone could read out hebrews 12 5 to 6 it says here the lord disciplines the one he loves so if god really loves you he will discipline you so uh, even his discipline is expressed out of love that's the beauty you know of our god so uh, he is a very loving god even in his disciplining there is only love so these are just some attributes of god that we could see we have not even begun to scratch the surface about all that god is and all that he stands for okay so whatever we could cover in the time limit that we had we have been able to look at there are many many more things that the lord is uh, and um, uh, yeah so you could go through your notes 
uh, in your notes there are some names of god mentioned and you know what each of the names signifies so maybe you can look at those things and uh, of course there's a whole bunch of stuff if you go to wayne grudem wayne grudem uh, tries to um, you know talk about these things in greater detail there are also some beautiful articles in the web uh, you know in, in 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 the internet if you were to go and just type out um, nature of god attributes of god so many lovely articles so yeah we'll just have to finish now because there is no more time left uh, so we'll close with a word of prayer lord we just thank you so much that you are such an amazing god and someone like you has freely offered yourself to us when we were imperfect and now we in fact when we are still imperfect you still offer yourself to us freely unconditionally and so anyone who wishes to all they have to do is repent and that's it you just turn your face towards them in favor so thank you o oh lord that you are such a loving god and it's amazing o oh lord that you in all of your omnipotence your omniscience your omnipresence uh, in all of your unlimited infinity you have given yourself to us so that everything that you have we can use and benefit from so i pray that we will be grateful to you o oh lord we will live lives that honor you because uh, someone as big as you has chosen to be as generous as that so we thank you for that may we honor your name o oh lord uh, in all that we do thank you lord in jesus name amen yes thank you so much for concentrating good people good students Thank you. Thank you.